On today's show, I'm talking NBA draft with Ben Pfeiffer. We're going to be looking at a couple of players, comparing them, having a bit of a a one-on-one debate about a bunch of players in the NBA draft. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter, as always, at redrock underscore b-ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. We've gone and done mock drafts. We've done your 48 player profiles of these draft guys. And what I thought we'd do now is get a couple of those and sort of compare them together. And to do that comparing, actually, you know what, before I introduce him, I've got to tell you that today's show is brought to you by the Locked On Podcast Network's live NBA draft show. NBA draft goat, Chad Ford, Locked On NBA draft host, Raphael Barlow, and Locked On NBA host, John Corrales, will be live this year covering the NBA draft. It's Locked On NBA draft 2021. Brought to you by Built Bar. Get local expert analysis on each pick. You might also see me on that show as well. So follow Locked On NBA on YouTube today and watch our live coverage July 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern. So let's bring in who we're going to talk about today. Not who we're going to talk about, who we're going to talk to. That is better because we're talking about these one-on-one NBA draft uh, battles, matchups, however you want to phrase it. And we're, uh, we're joined by someone who was on the, the show last year talking NBA draft prospects. He is an NBA draft analyst. You would have seen him on Twitter and hopefully you all follow him. Welcome back, Ben Pfeiffer. Ben, how are you? Good. How are you? I love that intro. It's it, it's so cool. Feel so feel so official. Like, yeah, it's... Yeah. Um, I'm excited to be back. Doing two thousand two thousand plus shows, you get into it, get into a rhythm. Even though I said, <laughs> I said to you before we recorded, I've been away for a couple of weeks. I haven't recorded a show for two weeks. I was so rusty, but as soon as it hit record, the lights go on and it all, it all comes back. What we're gonna do here? <laughs> what we're gonna do is we're gonna pit a couple of players together who, in general, across mock drafts or across people's opinions, might be thought of to be similar players. And we'll just talk about the, the the pros and cons of those guys. A little bit of a back and forward on those uh, on those guys now. So let's uh, let's start it off, Ben, with one that we've seen uh, or I've seen people talk about, and that is Davion Mitchell and Moses Moody. Now Mitchell is a guy that I've had people tell me, hey, oh, well, he's the obvious pick at pick number five. He's the guy the Warriors have to take at pick number seven. And then there are people who are like, no, like he is not anywhere close to that. Um, Moody is a guy whose name has ranged from five to six to eight to 10 to 14, all over that sort of range. And that's sort of how this draft feels a little bit after those top four guys. But let's talk Davion Mitchell. Let's talk Moses Moody. And you can tell me how crazy it is to have these two players together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the only one that I'm like, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, beyond the fact that I think Moody is like a far superior prospect, just I think like, like role wise, like you're drafting Davion as like a, I guess like D and rim pressure like combo, whereas like Moody is kind of your like traditional like three and D plus wing that is so highly coveted in, in today's league. And I mean, I just think Moody you know, w- w- with his translatable skill set. I mean, the, the, the shot making upside, I think is really real. You know, the passing, some attacking off the catch, uh, the finishing wasn't great this year, but I think it can improve as, as he adds strength and, and just gets stronger and more adept at using his length. And he's in like an awesome foul drawer, obviously a super smart and long and mobile defender. Um, and, and, then, and then Davion, well, I mean, I, he definitely has some really intriguing qualities, um, can pressure the hell out of the rim, super quick, um, space creation for his jumpers. But it's just it's just di- a difficult sell to take a small non-primary guard super high, especially when he's old. Um, you know, Mitch, Mitchell, I think, is like three years older than Moses Moody at this point. Um, and he's a worse shooter, you know, despite the, the hot shooting this year. Um, it's, it's hard for me to project that as anything more than just kind of a hot shooting streak right now because of his, his free throw indicators and the fact that he just ha- like these kind of out of nowhere, one year shooting jumps without real priors often in the past have you know been indicative of just, just that. I mean, like a, a hot shooting streak because three point, uh, three point percentage takes forever to stabilize. So that's why, I, I mean, I just broadly more skeptical of Davion. 
um, because you know I don't think there's just so much value. He's projected as more of like a backup to me, but still, I mean, d- d- definitely gonna be a good player. But I really like Moses Moody. So. Yeah, look, I'm I'm with you on that with Mitchell. Older, small, um, shooting is, is a worry. Uh, yeah, is he? Yeah, oh yeah, he's great. He he puts pressure on and hustles up defensively and can be really good in that respect. But the size is a real real concern. The age is a real concern. The shooting's a real concern. I wouldn't have them anywhere close. But the reason I put them together here is just that I've seen plenty of people say, well, Mitchell's the obvious pick. He's got to be a top 10. He's got to be top seven. He's easy top five. I'd take him at four. Like some crazy thought processes out there. So I just wanted to get these uh, get this out here as a discussion point. Yeah. So you could put your opinion out there, which again does mirror mine regarding these two guys. I have Moody over Mitchell. Uh, I think I've had him that way in every mock draft and it's a, a pretty sizable difference to me in that scenario. So let's let's move on to the next one of these matchups we're going to look at. And this one we're going to uh, take a look at is Josh Giddy and Scotty Barnes, two guys who both should be lottery picks. It appears that Barnes is firming to be the guy at number five. They both have um, questionable shooting. They both are good passers and good ball handlers. Um, obviously, Barnes played at Florida State. Giddy played down here for Adelaide in Australia. How would you view these two guys? Obviously, Barnes' defense is superior to Giddy's, but you know, where, does, where does Josh Giddy have the edge over Scotty Barnes? Yeah, I definitely prefer Giddy as a prospect decently, but I do I, I, I don't think it's like crazy to think the other way. And I think uh, for which one you know you take it kind of depends. I think Giddy is who you want if you're really targeting a creator, which you know is I, I think so valuable. Um, I, I think Giddy's probably a better passer just because he's more functional. I think he's a, you know, a, a better, a much better score, even though Giddy has his issues to score, you know, just better handle, better craft. I think a significantly better shooting prospect than, than Scotty Barnes as well. Um, and just, you know, someone who I think really projects more to play on the ball than, than Scotty. But I, I think if you're looking for like a role, like more of a big than like a wing player, like someone who can play in the short role or on DHOs or, you know, maybe spot up and attack closeouts, that kind of role. Because Scotty is obviously a phenomenal passer as well and can really take advantage of that, you know, playing like the four or something next to, you know, a really dynamic scorer. I think you go Scotty. And, and again, that Scotty's defense boils down in that equation as well, where, um, I mean, I, I think Giddy can get to a place where he's solid on defense just because he's like very smart and, and young and large. But Scotty, I mean, is a far far better defensive prospect. Will always be a better defender. Just so smart and, and long and, and and mobile for a guy his size. So I definitely prefer Giddy just because I really value that creation upside. But I think Scotty, you know, is also a very good prospect as well. Both yeah, both definitely lottery guys to me. Um, and I think depending on your team construction, if you have like a more established team with like your star creators, I think you probably want to go Scotty. But if not, then you go Giddy. I think. So which one, they've both got their shooting issues. Which one of these two do you think has the higher chance of becoming, let's say, a 35% three-point shooter? I think definitely Giddy. Um, I think especially towards the end of the year, Giddy flashed a lot more as a shooter and shot maker. I think his three-point attempt rate was around like 30, which is pretty good for a guy his role. Um, again, he's a better free throw shooter than Scotty. Uh, I think his touch to me, like at least anecdotally, is significantly better than Scotty's, which has always been an issue. His um, just a more willing shooter as well, more willing to take difficult pull-ups, uh, difficult off-dribble mid-range shots. So I think all those indicators, especially you know, considering I, I think Giddy is, especially has you know seen some rapid growth as a shooter. Where even going back to uh, you know last year at NBA Global Academy, he was far behind where he is as a shooter now. As whereas Scotty Barnes has kind of been stagnant, um, you know, as, as long as I've been tracking Scotty Barnes, which is since you know his junior year of high school, he's kind of been the same as a shooter. Um, so for those reasons, I think Giddy is definitely the better shooting prospect, which is a, a big reason why I have Giddy higher because you know, that's so important in, in the modern NBA. How high would you go on Josh Giddy? Would you have him in the mix at pick five? Absolutely, yeah. I think he'd probably be the guy I'd go with, honestly, uh, among realistic options. Yeah, um, I think he's that good i i think he is too i've put it out plenty of times i had him at like five or six in a few of my mock drafts and plenty of people like oh yeah he's barely a lottery guy or you're just biased because you're i'm sure you know how good he is i mean he is yeah, that's, that's right. Well, yeah, you're biased because you're Australian. So that's why you're taking an Australian guy that high. But look, I just think, again, the passing, there is some offensive upside there. I don't, look, yeah, he's not athletic. That's yeah, cool. Say, I am ne- not Australian and I love Josh Giddy. Thank you. Much, so. Thank you. 
And okay, there is athleticism concerned, but again, Luka Doncic is not athletic. So, you know, it, yeah. And you can improve those kind of tools too. I mean, Giddy has already put on like 15, 20 pounds of muscle in yeah. our strength this year. And like, I think like he has the frame to where he could get like really strong and be a wing who kind of overwhelms guys with his size. Cause you know, he's, he is six, eight, six, nine. Like he's incredibly large. Like he's, he's, he's a very big human. Yeah. <laughs> and he's, and his frame is not one of those frames where it's impossible to put on size. Yeah, I, he's I don't not think. like Durant or like Evan yes. Mobley. Yes, like. exactly. All right. Now, before we get on to the next one, I'm going to tell you guys about Built Bar because Built Bar gives you the freedom of choice because they have so many delicious flavors. There's something for everybody. These are the, the protein bars that taste like a candy bar, coconut flavor, raspberry flavor, strawberry, orange, cookies, and cream, which is actually my favorite. But if you don't even know what your favorite flavor is, just grab a mixed box. There's 18 bars in there. You get nine flavors, two of each, and you get to try to figure out which one is your favorite. And not only are they great tasting, but they're also healthy. Check out the macros, 17 to 18 grams of protein, calories ranging from 130 to 180, only four to five grams of sugar, and only four to five grams of net carbs. Amazing flavors, all tasty, all healthy. And Built Bar is the official protein bar of the US track and field team. So go to built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. The promo code is LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. All right. Let's go to the next uh, next matchup of players, and we're looking right at the top, the pointy end. These guys are not the same player. They are not the same type of player. They play very different positions, but they are the two who are in discussions for pick number two, it appears. It does appear like it is leaning heavily in one direction, but Evan Mobley and Jalen Green. I'll just start here with you, Ben. If you were Houston, who would you take? Uh, definitely Evan Mobley. And not because I don't think Jalen Green is good. Like I think Jalen Green's a phenomenal prospect. Um, I think he'd be a strong number one pick contender in quite a few drafts. Definitely last year, uh, he would have a pretty strong number one pick case. And, you know, he, he, he's very, very good. I think he's, you know, like you mentioned, it's, it seems like Houston's kind of trending towards Jalen Green. And, but, and, that, and like, he's probably going to be very good for them. But to me, Mobley's just a different level of prospect. I mean, just like a perfect modern big with true defensive player with your upside special mobility and rim protection ability for a guy that young and then offensively i think you know reasonably could be the ultimate like scalable big man that's a role man and a passer and a dribbler but also with some high-end scoring upside in you know his like little push shots around the 7 to 12 foot range some you know maybe even ball handling some closeout attacking some pull-up shooting potentially if he really develops that so I think Mobley, you know, can really be like a franchise changing secondary, second option, se- you know, second piece. Cause obviously he, he's not your primary engine, which is, you know, why I think maybe some people are skeptical, you know, taking like a big, who's not your primary offensive weapon, but I think he can definitely be your number two. And while Jalen Green, I think he can definitely be your primary scorer, like a, a guy who carries that scoring load on your team. I don't really think he can be your primary decision maker. Like he's not your Luca or LeBron to me. Um, in terms of guys who can really like run an offense uh, heliocentrically, which is really important. But I mean, that doesn't you know discount Green as a bad prospect. He's a very, 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 very special scoring prospect with you know good enough ancillary passing defense, I think, to be passable otherwise. But my like my Mobley versus Green take is really not about Jalen Green not being good. Like it's about Mobley just being that good of a prospect. Like I, I think Mobley is in the same tier as Cade. And that's not because I don't think Kate is good. I think Kate is extremely good, but I also think Mobley is that good. I have gone back and forward on this one. And my last mock, I did have Jalen above, but for the one that's coming out later this week, uh, Mobley will take back number two. And I don't really see that changing um, before the draft. So I am with you there. While you know, I do like Green, again, having that defensive ability of Mobley, the underrated passing ability of him and offensive ability there too. I'm, you know, the shot isn't there for him at this point. Um, yeah, poor free throw, poor three-point percentage as well. Uh, from Evan Mobley in college, I do think it can um, develop. Well, as Green has got significant defensive deficiencies, and yeah, as you said, the decision making and the passing isn't there for him. Still, yeah, really, really good pos- prospect. But I would have Evan Mobley also ahead of Jalen Green. So we uh, we agree on that one uh, as well. So let's now go on to the next one of these matchups we're going to look at, and that is Jonathan Kaminga. Now I've said. Johnson there, which is obviously misleading because there is multiple Johnsons, but it is in fact Keon Johnson that I'm talking about. Now, most people will look at this one, and I don't know your opinion on this one yet, Ben, but most people will look at this one and go, well, it's obviously Kaminga. 
Yeah, you know, he's that guy that should be picked at number five or should be picked at number six. But is there is there much difference in your mind between these two players? Who do you have as the better prospect? Um, and it is out is it outrageous for me to even compare these two? Um, I think there is much difference, but I think Keon's a lot better. Ooh, um, spicy. I'm really not a Kaminga guy. I I used to be. I mean, I, I had a lot of tentative optimism for Kaminga coming into this year because I thought he showed a lot of intriguing stuff his junior year at UIBL season, but he just kind of regressed, honestly. Um, and yeah, you'll be like, yes, he played against pros, but so did Jalen Green, and Jalen Green got better. So, I mean, Kaminga to me, like, just so behind in basically every aspect. He's never been a good shooter. The decision-making is is really problematic. The physicality in terms of, yes, he can overwhelm with his size and strength to the rim, but again, like, he so often would get walled off by smaller guards or turn his back or fail to create an advantage despite being so much stronger than other guys. And like, I'm, I'm pretty sure Kuming is only six, six, like Keon's like an inch shorter than him, um, which is probably lost on a lot of people. And, and, and then Kuming is just like a non-defender at this point. Well, obviously he could definitely get to a point where he's solid because of his tools, but he's just a non-defender. And while Keon has similar issues and like, he definitely is raw in terms of decision-making and some skill and some defensive awareness, he's just like a totally absurd athlete. Like he's one of the best athletes I've ever seen in terms of verticality and speed and just the way his body can contort and, and move through space. And the difference is that I think Keon has a lot of more interesting uh, qualities where Keon, I think, has really intriguing shot making upside where he was a really good mid-range pull-up shooter this year, which was a big improvement from high school, which gives me a lot of hope for the shot-making development in the future, along with just being like a super athlete for cuts and finishes. And, well, I mean, his handle isn't great, and his on-ball creation needs a lot of work. I think there were enough flashes to be, you know, to be optimistic. And then defensively, while, well, yes, he definitely had his issues in terms of awareness and, and feel and making the right rotations, like, some of the highs in terms of balls and aisle and, and, and mirroring on the ball and rotations and digs were just ridiculous because of his tools. So if you're like looking, if you're looking for a, a toolsy wing, I definitely think you should go for Keon just because the tools are that much more special than Kuminga where Kuminga is just kind of a strong power wing. Uh, to me, I don't really think he's shown enough for me to expect any real like primary creation upside, which is what I kind of was once banking on. He hasn't improved as a shooter at all over the last three or four years or really as a handler or a decision maker um, where I think Keon definitely has and Keon just has kind of the better tools for a raw guy. So, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely I, I'm fairly high on Keon um, decently. I mean, I, I think he's like a top 10 prospect, which is not I, I don't think that's, you know, a consensus at all. But, yeah, I mean, I definitely would prefer Keon here. But I mean, I, I mean, I understand taking Kaminga like he's I, I think there's definitely some upside. But. Yeah, I have Kaminga in my next upcoming mock marginally ahead of Keon, but the reason I put them together in this discussion is because I've got them relatively close and I can easily see uh, a reason why you would take uh, Keon ahead of Kaminga, even though, again, that is very, very far from a consensus opinion uh, across people who uh, who do watch the draft or people who may not watch the draft a huge amount. They still know the name Kaminga versus the name Keon Johnson. Now, Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way for you to bet on all of your sports action. Baseball season is in full swing, and you can track all of that action at Bet Online and get all the latest news, odds, and info for all of your sporting needs as well. Before that next pitch, head over to Bet Online on your laptop or mobile device and check out all of the great sporting news, sign up bonuses, and contest information. Don't sit on the sidelines anymore, as this is your chance to get into the game as teams prep for their runs to the playoffs. Head to the website, betonline.ag, or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your your first deposit. Bet online are your online sportsbook experts. Okay, let's uh, let's go on to the next one, and we are looking at a couple of guards, a couple of guards uh, from the SEC, Jaden Springer and Sharif Cooper, guys who probably go in that fourteen to twenty ish range. But as uh, I've said before, I think that there is. After you know, the first four picks, there's probably about 15 to 18 guys, I reckon, who are really, really close after that area. And these are two players who fall into that. Now, the difference between these guys to me is Cooper is this high usage, high assist, really good passer point guard who has significant size limitations and shooting limitations. 
Whereas Springer doesn't have that offensive ability. He still has some shooting concerns, but is a a very, very strong defensive guard who I do think has some significant offensive upside. So interested to see how you... And I, I haven't been able to sort of come to a consensus about where I place these two guys, but I know in my next mock, they've both actually risen up the board. How are you viewing Springer versus Cooper? Uh, I love both of these guys. I definitely prefer Springer. I mean, Springer's been my guy since you know, early season. Um, I, I have Springer higher on my board by a decent bit, but they're both phenomenal prospects. And I think, again, it's one where it kind of depends on what you're looking for. While I do think Springer's on-ball creation upside is one of the more underrated traits of the entire draft just because of his strength and flexibility um, and some of the footwork and touch and craft he's shown, I think is more impressive than he gets credit for, along with some of like the pull-up shooting flashes to – well, yeah, like the shooting concerns are – Kind of there, but to me, I'm, I'm quite confident in it, in it being good enough for his role. Where I mean, but I mean, he's nowhere near the creator that Sharif Cooper is. Where to me, he's the best passer in the class. Really special slashing craft as well with his burst and his strength for his size, and his ability to just get by and discard defenders and create advantages and manipulate the defense in every way possible. Um, but I mean, yeah, that's that's the big issue for. That's the big plus for Cooper, but. The fact that he is a small, non-scoring guard is an issue. Um, but to me, I just think the upside with Cooper, like I have too much FOMO being out on him because if he does hit, like he's going to be really, really good. So I'd rather be high on Sharif and miss than, you know, be low and, and, and you know, regret missing on a really special potential creator because, I mean, I don't think it's out of the question that he could develop a solid intermediate game because he does have some of the best touch indicators I've seen in a long time. Like his finishing craft for a guard is some of the best I've ever seen, despite him not being a very good finisher because of you know just the abysmal size and vertical ability. But and I also don't think he's like as horrible on defense as him he gets rep for. Like he's not Trey Young level bad, which I think matters. Like the difference between like just regular bad and worst in the league bad matters in terms of impact especially in the playoffs. Like, yes, he's always going to be targeted because he's tiny. But I think he can get to the point where he's not destroying your team's defense, which is important. Well, obviously, on the other hand, Springer is probably the best guard defensive prospect I've ever evaluated. And by that, I mean the last three or four years that I've been doing draft stuff seriously. Just just an unbelievable defender in, in every aspect for a guard. So, again, if you're a team that really desperately needs that on-ball creator, like the, the Knicks or even Orlando – I think I think Sharif is probably the direction you want to go. But anywhere else, I think if you can afford to bleed a little creation, I think you definitely go Springer because the defense and you know the, the, the well obviously not Sharif. I think the passing is spectacular um, for Springer as well, and some of the rim pressure can be really great. I think like in, in a lot of ways broadly, like what Springer can bring on offense is like Sharif light in terms of rim pressure plus passing. Obviously, it's you know both of those are manifest very differently and I'm not nearly as good as Sharif but similar and obviously Springer um, has other like massive strengths in other ways so both of these guys are clear like top seven eight prospects to me um, and I think that they're both spectacular I, I, so I, I would go Springer in a vacuum but they're, they're, they're both great and I don't love choosing so interesting that you have them both in your top seven eight I've got them both in my upcoming mock both top 12 um, still working out the final order there, but I, I do have them high, which I think is going to begin higher than majority of people, obviously not higher than you, but you'll see plenty of mock drafts where Cooper's going at 24 and Springer's going at 18 yeah. and, and things like that. And, and I do have both of those guys uh, significantly higher than that. Let's go on to the next one. We're looking at another couple of guards, Bones Highland and Trey Mann. Bones Highland from VCU, Trey Mann from Florida. Let's put their stats up on the screen. Both 20 years of age, 6'3", 6'4", guards. Um What's what's your thought on these guys? Again, they're probably both in that 20 to 25 sort of range. I think in general, the consensus would have man going ahead of Bones. Do you see it that way? Man, this is so close to me. Like, I, I I have them back-to-back on my board, like both right around back-end lottery. Oh, man, this is really hard. Um, I think I'd honestly have to go Bones just because I think Bones is a different level shooter than Trey Mann, where obviously Trey had a phenomenal shooting year this year, 
But one, this is his first year basically ever of really spectacular shooting where Bones has, you know, go, going back to high school, he's been a sniper. And I think Bones is even then a better shooter this season as well. While being so much, so much more bursty, uh, so much better getting to the rim, which the shooting plus rim, rim pressure for Bones is just a devastating combo. Whereas Trey is a better ball handler. Uh, probably a marginally better finisher and passer, but like the, the elite, elite ball handling, screen craft, manipulation with his handle, that's where, you know, Trey really shines in this in this conversation. And they're both, I think, probably, you know, end up similar on defense. This year, I think Bones probably had like the worst defensive tape of any prospect I watched this year, where, where Trey was bad, but not that bad. But I think like Bones was fine last year when he was in less of an offensive role. And I think they're going to you know level out similar in the league. Do you think it's, it's really tough? Do you think, I think that either all in all, uh, go ahead. Bones has a little more creation upside, which is why I'll get him. But like, re- real, really, really tight there. Like, I think they're both. It's it. This is like the definitely the, the toughest one for me so far. That was going to be my question in terms of yeah, can either of these guys be entrusted to be the primary ball handler for a team, or who would yeah. be most likely to develop into that guy? It's tough because, you know, both of them struggle as decision makers and passers. Both of them probably aren't guys you want running your offense, uh, which obviously, you know, is, is why they're not like higher picks for, you know, the, why they're not going to go higher. But as guys who can really like drive primary scoring, I think I just want to go all in on bones with the rim pressure as well. Because where, you know, Bo- that's something where man obviously can create advantages with his handle um, and his really great pacing and get into the paint that way. Bones can just win with with sheer speed, and he's like he's no slouch as a dribbler either. Like he can definitely handle. He's he's no Trey man, but he can dribble well enough. So I think that combo. Um, Trey's probably a little better of a passer, but I don't think it's crazy different. Um, so yeah, I think I'll go Bones. But I mean, if, if you went Trey, if you really believed his you know his handle lends to just better court navigation and being able to run an offense more than Bones even if you're trading a little shooting and rim pressure, I would totally understand that. So I, I'll go bones, but again, it's really, really close. Let's go to the next one. Now um, we're talking to older prospects, to different prospects, forwards slash guards, elite shooting guys. We're talking about here, Corey Kispert and Trey Murphy, the third. Let's bring their numbers up on the screen. Kispert, 22 years of age, 6'7 from Gonzaga. Trey Murphy, 6'9 from Virginia, was a transfer from Rice. Both guys are you know, really, really high-level shooters. Look at that true shooting, 67.4 and 67 for Kispert and Murphy, respectively. They are elite numbers. Uh, Murphy was a 50, 40, 90 guy, and Kispert wasn't far away from that as well. Obviously, a little bit of age difference between these two, but in essence, they're filling a similar role offensively or is there any difference there offensively and does the defensive difference which i would give to murphy over kispert does that put them uh significantly apart on your board i think kispert's a good bit better okay just because i think he has a lot more utility offensively while being fine enough on defense i think trey is a little overrated as a shooter because while yes like his free throw numbers are spectacular the volume is low there and while his catch and shoot three is is awesome he just has no shot versatility which I have, you know, detailed and researched as a really important component for shooting projection and really having defenses respect you. You know, you can do more than just stand in the corner and shoot catch and shoots. That you can sprint off movement or shoot from well beyond NBA range or shoot off the dribble, which Corey Kispert can do all of magnificently. Um, and, and Kispert's like a really good finisher for his role. He's large. He's stronger than Trey Murphy. He has a better handle, better finishing craft, better passer, basically better at, like, 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 aside from vertical athleticism, because I, I think Trey can definitely get up in space. Uh, I think Kispert's just flat out better at everything offensively, which for, you know, the role they're being drafted is like three and D plus utility wings. I definitely think you want to go with the guy with more offensive uh, leverage, which is Kispert. Definitely Mur- Murphy definitely is better on defense. No doubt. Um, really, really good lateral mover at six, nine, but I'm generally underwhelmed by his off ball defense. And I think his, he's like very good, but not special as a point of attack defender. And I think Kispert is, again, like has his issues with, with foot speed and change of direction, but is pretty large and strong and smart. I think a better off-ball defender than Trey, which I value a lot in a defensive scheme. 
So, it, like, if Kispert was was really this, like, terrible defender, I think it would be closer, but I just don't think that's the case. Um, I, I think Kispert often gets this billing as, like, a just, like, a one-dimensional, like, shooter, where I think he's really a lot more than that, as, you know, many people have pointed out, like my good friend Jackson Frank, who covers Gonzaga, uh, has pointed out, you know, he has so much more, where I think Murphy really is just that one-dimensional off-ball shooter, which to me just isn't super valuable in the modern NBA. I think he's definitely a rotation player, which, you know, probably means he's worth a first-round pick. But I think Kispert could really be, like, Joe Harris plus. So, and that's, like, a really, really good player. Interesting, because I have, I actually have Murphy higher than Kispert at, at this point. I did have Kispert higher, but just looking at the defensive versatility of Murphy, I did push him higher. So maybe I'm going to have to go and reevaluate that after after uh, hearing your, your chat on that. Maybe I'll have a chat with Jackson as well and see the direction there. But I, I did have them in a different order. So that's, it's good to have a little bit of a debate there. Let's go on to the next one. We're talking about two big men. And the next one, two international big men. That's why I'm comparing these guys here. Because again, we always will like to compare these guys who both come from overseas where many in the American audience wouldn't have heard of or seen these guys. Let's go with Alperen Sengun or Usman Garuba from Real Madrid. Uh, Sengun from Besiktas uh, over in Turkey. Sengun, uh, to, to me, Ben is the, the clear winner here. He put up historic numbers winning the Turkish League MVP at 18 years of age. Yes, there are concerns with him defensively. He hasn't really developed that shot yet, but what he was able to do was amazing. Whereas Garuba, I don't really have any concerns with him defensively. It's more, I guess, what he does on the other end of the court. What can he do anything at all offensively? But they are both big men. They are both international guys. So I thought it would be a good comparison here. Um, yeah, I've got Shingun. Not going to spoil what I'm doing from a mock draft coming up, but I've got him pretty high coming up in that one that's uh, coming in a couple of days' time. How do you compare Shingun and Garuba? Yeah, I'm not super huge on either guy, um, but I do prefer Garuba just because of like the defense providing a clear role. Uh, like you say, I mean, Garuba's a spectacular defender. He'd be the best, I mean, if he was two inches taller, he'd be the best defensive prospect in the class. Like, really special instincts and recognition and change of direction and hand usage has always been such a special defender. And the fact that he's able to do this against such great competition is awesome. Uh, and like you said, the the big concern and the reason I'm relatively low on Garuba is just because I don't think like, what does he do on offense? Yes. He's, I, I think the redeeming thing is he's a very good passer, quick processor can really work on the short roll, but can't score the finishing the shot. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I think he'll probably shoot catch and shoots, but other than that, like nothing really special. Uh, Shengun is interesting because he is like a really good basketball player, very skilled, pretty smart as well. But it's just really difficult for me to get that excited about a six foot nine, non shooting, non mobile center. Um, a guy who struggles to me in terms of vertical athleticism, in terms of ground coverage. And um, just, you know, someone who can, he, he, he can move a little in short spaces, cover ground in the paint. But in, I think in the modern NBA, if you have a 6'9 guy who's not really protecting the rim, like his niche has to be some sort of primitive versatility, which Shingun struggles with. And then, again, again offensively, like super, super talented post scorer, um, some good passing flashes as well. But I just like struggle to see what the role is because, I mean, I don't really understand the, the, the thing about him being like like a Kevin Love shooter because like he just doesn't shoot right now, which is so important to projecting future shooting. Like I think Kevin Love was a pretty outlier shooting development. And well, yeah, like he's a fine free throw shooter. But like I wouldn't think he has a significantly higher shooting ceiling than Garuba, for example, which I think a lot of people would disagree with. And I think, well, yes, the production is, is, is undeniable. You know, what he's done at his age in the Turkish league is really impressive, but I definitely think it's worth considering the competition difference between these guys um, whereas the Turkish league is not good. And whereas, you know, ACB and the Euro league is the best non-American competition. I think that was clear. If you, you know, the, these games are on YouTube, I, I recommend everyone go, go watch them, watch Shengun and Besiktas play against um, FS, who is probably the best team in the world with Shane Larkin, um, who's like the European Steph Curry at this point. And he just like was awful against that team. And it's it, again, like, like it's it's really difficult competition. And an eighteen-year-old against the best team, best non-American team in the world. Like, I think most the, the expectation shouldn't be that he dominates. But I mean, you watch a guy like Garuba, really, you know, excel on defense against that same competition, or like a prospect, um, 
like Teo Maladon last year. I think a lot of people would consider Shengun to be a better prospect than Teo Maladon. Um, and they're obviously super different, and I'm not making that comparison. But, like, Teo was relatively, like, a pretty good EuroLeague player at 18. And, like, I wasn't in on Teo, but, like, he, he was productive and impactful in the EuroLeague at 18 years old. Whereas Shengun, when he played that better competition, obviously, like, you, you should, shouldn't get caught up in small sample size. But I think when you're parsing differences like this, it does matter. I, th- they're both solid. I mean, I'd have them both, in, like, in, like, the 17 to 30-ish kind of range. And again, it kind of depends on what you're looking for. Like, if you really want someone more offensive oriented, oriented, then I think it's fine to go Shengun. But in most cases, I just prefer Garuba because I think, like, his defense can provide real security in the league, where I'm not sure Shengun really has that. Interesting. Now, I have them the other way around, but yeah, again, that it's offense versus defense there really. And how yeah. you're valuing these players, it comes down to that between these two. And again, that's going to be different yeah. for, for other teams and other players and what they're looking for and all that sort of stuff. So that is an interesting discussion. That brings us to the end of our chat here regarding the NBA draft prospects. Ben, uh, thank you for joining us. And if people want to follow Ben on Twitter, it's Ben underscore Pfeiffer. You can see it on the YouTube video there. So you can go and follow him uh, over there. Ben, thank you for coming back on to the show and talking NBA draft prospects for the 2021 NBA draft. Of course. Thank you again for having me. Uh, This debate format was really fun. I think it's a nice exercise to kind of get you to think a little more critically about the prospects here, you know, evaluating in comparison to each other and what you value more. And it was fun. Uh, hopefully do this again next year. Yep. Years to come. We can, uh, we can book that in for next year. I reckon Ben, thank you again. <laughs> I'll schedule my calendar for yep. a year in advance. <laughs> So that'll do it for today's show. Don't forget, follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, the Odyssey app, and on YouTube. If you're watching this, hit thumbs up, hit subscribe. Also check out the Locked On NBA YouTube channel. You can see those videos. I've got them on my channel here on my playlist down below. Locked On NBA and all Locked On shows are now going to, to YouTube as well. Guys, follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore b Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.